Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 44. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, is it okay that we are here? Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And the voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you, look at my son. For he is my only child, and behold, a spirit seizes him, and suddenly cries out. It convulses him, so that he foams at the mouth, and shatters him, and will hardly leave him. And I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. Listen, I could listen to Jason Faria read the Bible to music for days and days and days. Wasn't that just awesome? Um, we we kind of did a modern twist of what's been going on for the last 2,000 years, and that's the public reading of Scripture. So uh, that's not my voice. I know I wish I sounded like that, but that was our sound guy in the back, Jason Faria, and he did a great job. Great, great job. <clears throat> now, a few years ago, I, we were up in the mountains in Utah, and there was, for some reason, I had to take an Uber to get back to the kids. And you have to understand something about me. I'm a Kennedy, not a Kennedy of Massachusetts, but a Kennedy of Oklahoma. And a Kennedy of Oklahoma, uh, we can talk to anyone at any time. Uh, practically, we can talk to a wall if the wall will listen. And my kids know this about me. When I get into an Uber, I strike, a, I strike up a conversation with the Uber driver because it's awkward, right? You're sitting there, the person's driving you. Oftentimes, I get in the front seat, which really creeps my kids out. But I hopped in this Uber, and he began engaging me in a conversation. We started talking about money. Now, not in the way that you think that people, preachers talk about money, but just things like if you had $10 million or if you were the one in Los Angeles County who won the $2 billion Powerball lottery ticket, what would you do with that money? Well, as a man of God, I would obviously tithe like every single one in the room would, right? You would all tithe. But I would find the swankiest coolest house, right? I, I, I would, it would be macked out, you know, I would magically become thin. I mean, everything would go right in the world. Well, this Uber driver's asking me this question, and, and I stopped him in the middle of it, and I said, why, like, why are you asking me this question? It's an interesting question, but why? He said, well, a couple of weeks ago, I had a lady get in my Uber who had just won a $10 million lawsuit. $10 million, this is a lot of money. 
That's a lot of money, right? And so I said, well, what did she say? How did she answer the question? And he goes, well, she said she was taking her money and moving to San Antonio, Texas. And I'm like, what? San Antonio? Like, no slack on San Antonio. You know, I love the Alamo, and that's about it in San Antonio. But you know, no slack on San Antonio. But there are better places to live in San Antonio. And for me... It's living in the mountains. There's something about the mountains that I can breathe better. Everything feels right in the mountains. I can look over the treetops and it's just, there's something majestic and spiritual. For Rachel, it would be the beach. For me, it would be the mountains. If we won the Powerball lottery, baby, we could live at both places. It'd be fine, right? (laughs) But there's always been something for man that is spiritual and mystical about a mountaintop experience. Man has always had this spiritual connection to the mountains. And, and I remember in high school and college where you have to go through those periods of reading different types of material. And how many remember the myths that maybe you read, the Greek myths and the Roman myths that you read in high school and college? And I, I loved those. And all of those had gods connected to the mountains. As a matter of fact, I have on the screen here a picture of the real-life Mount Olympus. This is what Mount Olympus looks like in, uh, in Greece, and, and it's said that Alexander the Great would frequently come to the base of the mountain to offer up a, a sacrifice to his god Zeus, who lived high on the mountain. I've had the opportunity to go to Athens and I've seen the Parthenon, which is a, another mountaintop experience. It's, it's this temple that sits above the city. Gods have always been associated with the mountains, whether it be Athens or uh, ancient Greece with Mount Olympus. Even the kings were often associated as miniature gods and pharaohs and kings and, 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 and emperors would sit on elevated thrones above everyone else. We're told in the Bible that that the first king of Israel was chosen because he was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. There was always this metaphor that anybody who was a god would be above it all. We, matter of fact, we just sang that, right? Gods have always been associated with the mountains, People oftentimes had to ascend to their gods, and Israel's culture was no different. If you read the Old Testament, you see Abraham would go up and offer a sacrifice of of Isaac on a mountain. Moses went up to meet with God to receive the Ten Commandments on the mountain, and the temple was the highest point of Jerusalem where the presence of God dwelt, and the worshipers would have to go up to the mountain. Anywhere you read in Scripture, mountaintop or high places were always associated with the gods. They never went down to worship. They always went up. I've been to Jerusalem and I've made the trek that most people would make from the valley up to the temple mount. And it is a calf burning exercise. If you want the buns of steel, you've got to do that walk like every single week. I I, I remember walking it thinking, imagining myself carrying the equipment and the sacrifice to go worship my God because God's always sat elevated above it all. And as the people of Israel, as the Hebrew children would make that ascent to go worship, they began to sing songs that are actually recorded in Psalm 120 through 134. And they would sing these songs as they went up the mountain. They were songs of ascent. That's what they were called. Let me read you one just as an example. Psalm 121, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you. You're going out and you're coming in from this time and forevermore. And they're singing these songs as they would go meet with their God up on a mountain, just to kind of help them focus and think of the purpose, why they're going. Now, in our text that Jason read for us today, 
It's all about a mountaintop experience. As a matter of fact, Luke chapter 9 records two mountaintop experiences. The first one, which isn't read, I'll, I'll just give you a brief synopsis. Jesus takes his disciples to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, Luke doesn't record the actual name. We get the actual name from the other gospels. But Jesus takes them up to this place called Caesarea Philippi. And there in Caesarea Philippi, there's an altar that people can sacrifice to their gods. It's even said that children were sacrificed up on that mountain. It was a pagan, wicked place, high elevated above the plains of Jerusalem. And Jesus takes them up on this mountain and he goes, okay, guys, here's what I want to know. Who do you say I am? Now there's a point to everything that Jesus is saying and there's a point to everything that the gospel writers are recording. Jesus takes them up on a mountain which is typically associated with the gods and he says, who do you say I am? Now, let me paint some context. They just went out two by two and did miracles and they're excited to tell Jesus about this. They just seen him feed the 5,000 and Jesus brings them up and says, who do you say I am? Some people go, well, you're a good teacher. Okay, it's not the best compliment for Jesus, but all right. Or, hey, maybe you're Elijah. And Peter, always ready to speak out loud, says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the risen God. It's this great moment of proclamation from Peter where he sees in that moment that Jesus is who he says he is. And that's great news, right? Peter is declaring something that everybody in Israel had hoped for, that one day a Messiah would come and set the captives free and, and bring liberty and bring life back. And Peter declares this, it's a good moment. And Jesus basically says, not so fast. You see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die. You think I, ha I, I am Messiah, that's true, but... I'm going to die. And so think about the joyous proclamation and then utter depression. This is two polar extremes of what's going on in this moment. The best way I could describe it is like this. If I came to you and said, hey, I'm going to write you a check for $20 million and it will clear. I have that much money in my bank account. I'm going to write you $20 million. You'd be like, that is awesome. I need to run and see Pastor Mark so I can pay my tithe. Amen, amen, good, 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 great, great, great. And then I'm gonna live off the 18 million. You know, it's, a thank you, Jason, that is such, man, you'd be indebted to me. But then I would write the check and hand it to you and go, but here's the catch. The government called, the state of California called, really, the state of California called and said that you owe 100 million in taxes, utter despondency, right? You would be on the floor weeping and praying and God deliver me from this moment. So two polar extremes, that's what's happening in this moment. This great proclamation up on a mountain that Jesus is God all the way to the depths of despair that this God is going to die. So I don't think Jesus figured out that the disciples were really dealing with that too well. So he takes them on eight days later, a second mountain experience. This is from the text. He takes three people, Peter, James, and John. Now, the reason you have to understand why he takes three, I think it has to do with what Deuteronomy tells us in 19, which is a, a law passage that out of the mouth or the establishment of two or three witnesses, something will be you know, declared right. And I, I think he's doing that so that at one day they would declare it out of their mouths and witness to the world his glory and his divinity. And we know that they did because J James in chapter two of his letter talks about Jesus being the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, this phrase dripping with God-like divinity. And Peter in his second letter uh, as he's reflecting on this moment, calls, calls Jesus the glorious Lord God using the same type of language. And John, who writes Revelation, the first chapter of Revelation, where he's declaring God, Jesus in this God-like term, and even in his gospel says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. So they proclaim what they see in that moment, but they almost missed it. The Bible often 
tells us that in key moments, the disciples were asleep. And this is no different. There they are. Jesus takes them up on a mountain. And I don't know whether it's the hike or whether they had some sort of version of ancient Jerusalem's annex. They fell asleep. They were out. They were gone. They were snoring. And in this moment, something glorious happens while they're sleeping. Matthew tells us, he uses the term that Jesus transfigures, which is like a metamorphosis. Think of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, a complete change. There's this moment of complete change. Jesus goes on the mountain, human looking, and he has this metamorphosis into this divine being radiating light. And all of a sudden, two heavyweights of the Old Testament show up, Elijah and Moses. And there they begin to have a conversation. So think of this, on the mountain, there would be both human witnesses and heavenly witnesses. And Luke 9 tells us that this conversation is basically this. Here's what my mission is, and my mission is to die. Now, the phrase that Luke uses here in the English is departure or going away, whatever version you have. But the word in the Greek is actually exodus. Jesus is talking about his ultimate exit, and his mission, and it's just this wonderful, rich, cool conversation as the disciples are sitting over there dozing off in the corner. Before I get further into the story, the question has to be asked, why Moses and why Elijah? Do you ever do that with the Bible? You're reading something, you're like, Moses and Elijah, okay. Do you ever stop and go, hmm, I wonder why them? So let's start with Moses. Why Moses? Moses represents the law. Moses, not only in the Israel culture, represented the law, he represented the beginning, the beginning of the nation, the the beginning of this great covenant that God would fulfill with Israel, the, 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 the beginning of the nation state, on and on and on. He represents the law and the beginning. That's who Moses was. Moses would have been the most trusted person in all of Israel. Even to that day, they were continuing following the law that Moses would pen with his own hand as God delivered it to him. So why Elijah? Well, Elijah was the prophet of the prophets. He was the one that everyone pointed to as the man when it came to the prophets. As a matter of fact, Elijah is always associated with end time things. Malachi 4 says this, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the father to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction." So you have Moses, who's representing the beginning. You have Elijah representing the end. And you have Jesus talking about the deliverance from mankind. So think about it from a theological perspective, because that's the world I operate in. Here's what this passage is really telling us the conversation was about. Jesus is saying that my mission is from the beginning to the end, and I will deliver mankind. It's a powerful moment that's recorded right there in the text. And yet the disciples are over here dozing. I mean, just out. Jesus brought them up here to be witnesses to the glory that he wanted to reveal to them, and they are gone. But what happens in Luke chapter 9 is pretty powerful. They wake up. They almost missed it. And let me stop with a real practical point for you for a moment, church. If you're not careful, you can be asleep or miss God moving in your midst. You can let it fly right by you without ever recognizing it. I see it happen all the time. For some people, they they miss it because of the ease of life. Life is too comfortable. They've got everything going for them. Man, they've got they've got the two and a half kids and the three dogs and the cars parked in the driveway and this and that. And if they're not careful, the ease of life becomes a barrier or a blinder or can make you fall asleep to God moving in your midst in that moment. For others of you, it is, it is the 
pain of life. Life is overwhelming. You're struggling. You're, you're hurting. You're broken. And, and, and you're looking at your brokenness so much, you can't even see God moving in your midst. Others of us, it's just pure distractions. We're busy. I can't make it to church on Sunday, Pastor. Why? Well, I've just been busy. I got kids, I got grandkids, I got dogs, I got cats, I got a lawn to mow, I got a harvest to do, I got this and this and this and this and this and this. And you can busy yourself out of the move of God. I've seen it over and over again as I've pastored for 20 plus years that people can have all kinds of distractions that keep them away from God moving in their life. And then there's other people who miss the move of God because of hate and anger and bitterness dwelling deep inside their heart. They're eaten up with it. And they're so focused on what other people have done to them and they become a victim that they never see the presence of God move in their midst. These are the things that make us go to sleep. God's right here on the mountain. He's moving. He's showing himself in a glorious way, but we're over here dozing because of our own life issues that we can't seem to navigate out of. The disciples almost missed it because they were asleep. But the Bible tells us they wake up. And I I can imagine Peter kind of stretching out, opening up his eyes, rubbing his eyes and going... Hey, John, do you see Moses? Right? He wakes up, he sees what's happening, and he immediately goes to Jesus, and he sees these titans of the faith that represent the prophets, that represent the law, that represents the beginning, that represents the end, and he sees Jesus beaming, this radiance beaming, and Peter's first response is, let's build some tents for both Moses, Elijah, and you. Now, there's some significance here that might bore you, but there's, just, there's a theological moment here. Down around this time, they're f- celebrating what's known as the Feast of Tabernacles. And really, when you read certain versions of the Bible, Peter doesn't say tent. He says tabernacle. And it's just this shelter. And, and they did that in Jerusalem to celebrate the exodus coming out and going into a new land. And so Peter sees this and goes, this is the moment where we can just camp here, Lord. Let's just, let's just build a tent for you and Moses and Elijah and me and James and John. We'll just sit up here and just soak it all in. Oftentimes, Peter would try to move Christ off of mission, and this is one of those moments where he's moved, trying to move Christ off mission. Christ's mission isn't there on the mountain. Christ's mission is actually on the valley, Because there's a story running parallel to this. And it's a story of a dad who's bringing his sick child to the disciples. I'm a dad. I've got a 16-year-old and 12-year-old girls. God help me. It's a rough life. Our dogs are girls. Our guinea pigs are girls. Our birds are girls. We don't have birds. Like they're too hollow, and it makes it creeps me out. But anyway, I have two girls, and I remember Clara, sixteen, being sick and having to take her to the doctor and get all her shots. Parents, you recall that moment taking your kids to the doctor and making the doctor poke holes for a woman. I, I remember that. I remember taking Clara, and I have a picture of it, um, and, and she was just so skinny. And I gave her this precious baby to the doctor and knowing the doctor is doing what's right. And as he's giving her shot after shot, Claire's looking at me like, what is going on? Why are you letting this happen, dad? What's sick kid, a broken bone, a kid in the hospital. A sick kid has a way of just wrecking your life as a parent, doesn't it? I would rather be sick than them. I would rather go through pain than them. Imagine the desperation for a moment as this dad brings this baby boy who's throwing himself on the ground and having seizures, who's possibly throwing himself into the fire, who's broken. And he brings him to the disciples that he's heard 
produces miracles and bringing his disciple, th- this boy to the disciples and they look at him and go, we can't do anything. God can't stay in the mountain. God has to be in the valley. And that's what happens for Peter and James and John in that moment as Peter is saying, hey, let's just stay up here and soak in the presence of God. The scriptures tells us that immediately a shadow overwhelms them. Moses and Elijah are gone and Jesus looks at them. This is my paraphrase and says, boys, we've got to go down there because down there is where they need me, not up here. Jesus goes down and he grabs the the baby boy as this man is holding him and Jesus looking frustrated. I mean, can you imagine dealing with the disciples who you have walked with and trained and tried to help learn about God and you see miracles happen? Can you imagine dealing with 12 idiots for three years? Pastor's nodding his head like, I've dealt with you for like 20. I get it. Can you imagine that? And so here's what happens. Jesus grabs the boy and he heals the boy and he restores the boy. As amazing as the transfiguration story is, it cannot be fully realized until you realize that the God on the mountain descends to us and descends even further Philippians tells us that Jesus doesn't just come down on earth. He goes down to, uh, to death to conquer it for us. When I studied this passage in all its beauty, it, it brought me goosebumps. I was blown away. Jesus is saying, I'm the God on the mountain, but that is not good enough. I have to be in the God in the valley because in the valley is where you need me. You see, the problem is we put God on the mountain and we always try to ascend to God. But the truth of the matter is, is we don't go up to him. He descends to us. I lift my eyes up. Where does my help come from? It doesn't come from me marching up a hill. It comes from God sprinting down the hill to us, to redeem us, to change us, to shape us, and to heal us. Heidi Newmark uses these verses as she tells this story of of transfiguration in her memoir, Breathing Space, A Spiritual Journey in the South Bronx. And and she details the transformation of a church she served for almost 20 years. The church is aptly named Transfiguration Lutheran Church. And it's in the middle of the Bronx in a struggling, barely surviving community. And that Transfiguration Church was basically a church where they kept their lives closed off to the world around them. They lived in a world where there was crime and drug abuse and a lack of education and opportunity and a lack of hope. But this passage, the work of Jesus rebuking the unclean spirit and the transfiguration was enough for Newmark to make transformation in her own community. Here's what she says. When Peter and the others came down from the mountain, They found a father and a child gasping for life. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father, and they found transfiguration. And so it is when the disciples of the church unlock the doors of their private shelter and step out into the neighborhood. They did meet the distress of the world around them, but they also discovered the transfiguration for themselves and a community. She continues by saying, living up in the rarefied air isn't the point of transfiguration. It was never meant to be a private experience of spirituality moved from the public square. Here's the point. If God doesn't stay on the mountain, neither should we. Our spiritual experiences are never created for us alone. They're created for the world. I love the things of the Bible. And I love themes of the Bible. And this moment of God coming down is a theme of the Bible, especially in the New Testament. You have the incarnation where Christ becomes a baby and enters into the earth. You have the transfiguration, and then you have Pentecost. When I look at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, 
I think that was the moment it clicked for the disciples. You see, they were all about themselves in the gospel. Who's gonna have more power? Who's gonna have more title? Who's gonna have more authority? Who gets to do this, Jesus? Who gets to do that in your kingdom? I need to know, Jesus, if I'm gonna follow you. But when they come to the book of Acts, they realize it is not about themselves, but it's about the world. You may know the story in Acts chapter two. Jesus ascends up into heaven on a mountain, Acts chapter 1. He tells, the, hundred and, he tells the, the crowd there to go and wait for a promise. And so 120 gather in an upper room. And all of a sudden as they're praying, there's the sound of wind. Wind associated in the Old Testament often has to do with the presence of God. So they're hearing the physical presence of God enter into the room, this whoosh. I mean, just think about it. If we were in an upper room and the doors were closed and we hear this loud, loud sound of wind, but then a second manifestation happens, fire sits on their head. And I always envision this in a Sunday school way where it's a little teardrop, you know, like on the flannel boards. Maybe you were, grew up in church, maybe you're not, but that's how I envision it. But it was, it was obviously something that was spectacular. The fire represented God's leading in the wilderness. So you have this physical manifestation and it's powerful People start speaking in tongues, right? We're, we're Pentecostal. We should be able to say speak in tongues without shuddering and being nervous about it. People were speaking in tongues. The, the writer of Acts, Luke, records that somewhere between 15 and 16 dialects, languages were being spoken by people who were poor fishermen and poor farmers and just people who were common. They were speaking unknown languages. This is where I think it clicked. Now think for a moment. Peter, a few months before this, is up on a mountain and he's seeing the manifestation of God and he says, let's just park here and make it about us. But in Acts chapter 2, he stands up and he says, we've got to be people of the valley as well. You know how I know? Because the Bible tells us that he begins to preach. Now, it's a smaller room that they're in. It's, it's not a huge room, but we know, we know because Acts records this, that 3,000 people are saved in that moment and they are baptized. Well, where can you baptize 3,000 people? We have a, a big church here. This is a big room. And, and one day, I, I know our dream is one day we'll have 100 or 200 every baptism Sunday baptizing them in this giant tank. Wouldn't that be awesome? That's a big room, right? Where can you baptize 3,000 people in Jerusalem at a given's notice? There's only one place. It's the temple. So follow me here. The presence of God is in the room. It doesn't get contained in the room. It spills out into the city and people hear the message of God because the impact that's happening in the room. If I can stretch the metaphor a little bit, the experience you have on the mountain is for the valley. And it must, listen to me, it must spill out because I've seen a lot of churches that go, this is a great experience for us. Let's just build a couple of tents here and just soak in it. And when that happens, it shuts off. It shuts off. Listen to me. You want revival? Get empowered in the mountain and go be the incarnational presence of Jesus in the valley. That's how revival happens. That's how revival happens. God never sits on the mountain. He always descends to us, and so should we. In order to be effective in the valley, we have to be transformed by him. There's two types of people who come to church, and I know this. There are people in the valley People who are needing God's help, they need something to happen for them. 
They need God to bring healing. They need God to bring a miracle. They need God to bring restoration, salvation. Those are people in the valley. And then there's a second type of people. Those are people on the mountain needing God to do something through them. Through them. And in this room, I dare say we have both. I think there are people in this room right now who need a touch from God. God to do something significant in your life. So here's how we're going to close. We've got about 10, 15 minutes. Here's, we're going to get Pentecostal here, and I hope that's okay. But here's what I want to do. If you need God to do something in your life, you're someone in a valley situation, I want you to come and stand right up here. Come stand right up here. Don't be ashamed of it. We all have valley moments. We all have moments that that God needs to do something. We need God to produce miracles. Come on. Come on. Let's move. Let's move. Because I believe that God's going to do something significant right down here. I think God's going to do something significant in this moment. We're going to let them filter down here. These are people who need God to do something in their life. We've all been there. Now, the the pastors in the room, if y'all could gather around them or, or just be available for prayer. But here's the second challenge. If you want God to do something through you, I want you to come line up over here. If you want God to do something through you, Everything's going good in your life. Man, God's, God's been good to you. You don't seem to have a problem in the world, God. But, but God can use you in this moment, and he uses you to empower you for people in the valley. All right, just line up over here. Line up over here. Here's what we're going to do. Without music, without any fanfare, we're just going to start praying. God, I need something from you today. Come on, we're Pentecostal in this room. Y'all can pray, y'all can seek God. We'll have pastors come around and lay hands on you. God, I want to, you to move through me so I can do something in the valley that I can help people, that I can minister to people. God, I need a miracle in my life. Come on, let's cry out to God right now. Father, we need you. We are broken, we are hurting. God, we're in a valley right now and we need to show up in a strong way. If I have pastors, Pastors and elders and, and uh, uh, staff members here, just start led prayer workers, just start walking around and laying hands on people. We don't, have to, we don't have to have any fanfare. God, use me in this moment. God, use me. Show me what you want me to do with what you're doing in my life. Empower me, God, with your presence. If, if you speak in a heavenly language, if you speak in tongues, just begin to praise God in tongues and let's see what he's going to do in this moment. Father, I pray for every single person in this room. God, whether they need something from you or they want you to move through them, we are asking for you to show up in this room and move in a mighty way. Father, for every single person in these altars, for every single person praying, for every single person seeking you, may you do something significant right now. God, you are the God of the mountain who descends to us in our time of need. You are the God of the mountain who empowers us for the world. Father, I ask you to do that right now. Right now, Jesus. All right, folks who have been praying on this side about God using you, I want you to go to this side right now and lay your hands and begin to pray for the people who need something from God. Don't be shy. Just start moving and just start praying. We're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. You can't make a mistake. God's going to use you in this moment. I know he's going to do that. Find somebody who needs, lay your hands on them, pray audibly over them. 
Let's see God use you in this moment. There might be prophetic words. There might be healings that manifest. Y'all can come on stage so you can make your way down that way if you need to. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you as you pray for these people. If God gives you a word, you speak that word over them.
I love this story in Luke. It demonstrates so beautifully what we're called to do. We're not called to go Sunday to Sunday, experience after experience after experience for our own purposes. We are to be the incarnation of Christ to the world. That's the challenge for this week. We're going to continue praying in the altar, but for those who are uh, sitting down, let me bless you and you can be dismissed. Father, I thank you for your word today. I pray that you watch over it. You perform it in our lives. You challenge us with it. And Father, I pray you bless your people with health. God, you bless them with strength and wisdom. You bless them with your presence this week, not just for our own purpose, but that we can bless the world. In your name, amen.